Every year, the world produces more than 70 million tonnes of aluminum, a metal found in almost everything around us, from airplanes and automobiles to beverage cans and the aluminum foil in our kitchens. What is truly remarkable is that to make it, hundreds of millions of tonnes of a reddish rock called bauxite must be processed. But how is it done? To find out, we step inside one of the largest aluminum metallurgical complexes in the world to uncover the entire process. Aluminum is one of the most common elements in the Earth's crust, but extracting it on a large scale is a story of innovation that took time to take off. In 1825, Danish chemist Hans Christian Ørsted succeeded in isolating it for the first time in a laboratory. However, the method was so expensive and complicated that aluminum was valued higher than gold. For decades, it was used only for jewellery or luxury items for the elite. Everything changed in 1886, when two inventors working independently, American Charles Martin Hall and Frenchman Paul Eru, developed an electrolytic process that made it possible to efficiently extract aluminum from bauxite. This breakthrough, known as the Hall-Eru process, revolutionised the industry and paved the way for mass production. Shortly after, in 1888, Austrian chemist Karl Bayer refined a method to purify bauxite and obtain alumina, pure aluminum oxide, the raw material needed for electrolysis. These discoveries coincided with the rise of the Industrial Revolution, where aluminum's lightness and corrosion resistance made it ideal for new technologies. In the 20th century, during both world wars, it became a strategic resource for manufacturing aircraft and military vehicles, boosting its global production. In peacetime, aluminum found its way into everyday life, from construction to transportation, driving progress across key industries and establishing itself as a cornerstone of the modern economy. But how does a reddish rock become the metal we all know? It all begins in the bauxite mines, the rock that gives birth to aluminum. These mines are mainly found in tropical regions such as Australia, Venezuela or Brazil, where millions of years of rainfall and erosion transformed aluminum-rich rocks into massive reddish deposits. That distinctive colour comes from iron oxide, one of many minerals that accompany aluminum in bauxite. To reach it, the top layer of soil and vegetation must first be removed. Though drastic, this step is carefully planned using geological maps so that only the necessary areas are cleared. Bulldozers and excavators handle the heavy work, preparing the ground for the next phase, drilling. This is where engineering comes into play. Strategic holes are drilled into the rock, calculated with software that predicts how the terrain will fracture. Carefully measured explosives are placed inside to break the bauxite into manageable fragments. The detonation is not chaotic. It is a precisely controlled process designed to reduce dust and guarantee safe operations. Once the rock has been fragmented, enormous excavators load the material into trucks capable of carrying up to 100 tonnes in a single trip. These vehicles travel along internal mine roads hauling the bauxite to stockpiles or initial processing areas. Many mines use the side casting method, where excavators place the extracted material in orderly piles along the sides, allowing excavation to go deeper without interrupting workflow. Dust, a common challenge in open pit mining, is controlled with suppression systems that spray water or chemical agents. Sensors installed on the machinery monitor efficiency in real time, enabling immediate adjustments and ensuring that extraction remains as productive and safe as possible. In the largest mines, operations are organised like massive staircases. Layers, sometimes 10 or more, are carved out, and on each level the same cycle repeats – drilling, blasting and hauling. Step by step, the terrain gives way until the deposit is exhausted. Smaller fragments are handled with the side casting method, while larger blocks are taken to massive storage piles. Conveyors, cranes and front loaders arrange the bauxite by size and quality. Some piles rise dozens of metres high and are monitored with sensors to prevent collapses or contamination. This stage is not just about stacking material, it also serves to mix different grades of bauxite, creating a more uniform composition, a key factor for the next steps. Once the piles are ready, they go through an initial selection process. Here. Rocks with too many impurities are discarded, 
and only high quality bauxite continues its journey, it is loaded into rail cars or containers and transported to the ports. Once there, massive cranes transfer the ore onto bulk carriers, ships designed to move massive loads of tens of thousands of tonnes. During the voyage, samples are sent to laboratories where moisture and aluminum content are measured, allowing every detail to be adjusted at the refinery, because in this industry, nothing is left to chance. This is where the chemical transformation begins. At the refinery, the bauxite enters the buyer process, the standard method for turning it into alumina, the base of aluminum. The first step is to crush the rock in mills until it becomes a fine powder. That powder is then mixed with caustic soda in tanks called digesters. Under heat and pressure, the soda dissolves the aluminum compounds, leaving behind impurities known as red mud. This step is critical. It separates what is valuable from what is waste. The digesters are fully automated and carefully monitored. Temperature, pH, pressure, everything is tracked in real time. Chemically, it can be summarized in one key reaction. Aluminum hydroxide transforms into soluble sodium aluminate. After digestion, the mixture moves to large clarifiers, where the liquid aluminate is separated from the red mud. The residue is filtered and washed to recover soda and is often reused in other industries such as cement production. The cleaned aluminate continues forward. Next comes precipitation. Small particles of aluminum hydroxide are added as seeds. Slowly, the solution cools and crystals start to grow around these seeds. It is a slow process, up to three days, but carefully controlled to ensure crystals of uniform size. Once they have grown sufficiently, the crystals are separated from the solution through thickeners and filters, then washed with hot water to remove traces of soda. They are dried in rotary kilns where hot air gently removes moisture. The result is a pure white material, aluminum hydroxide, ready for the next big step, calcination. Here is where things get interesting. Calcination, the stage in which aluminum hydroxide is finally transformed into pure alumina, the white powder that will become the basis for metallic aluminum. At this stage, the hydroxide is fed into giant kilns either rotary or fluidized, where it reaches temperatures above 1000 degrees Celsius. Under this extreme heat, the molecule changes. It loses water and becomes anhydrous aluminum oxide. Put simply, the moisture is removed, leaving alumina with more than 99% purity. These kilns operate continuously and include heat recovery systems, since calcination is one of the most energy-intensive stages in the chain. In fluidized kilns, the hydroxide powder is suspended in a stream of hot gas, ensuring even heating and preventing clumps from forming. At the same time, emissions are controlled to meet strict environmental standards. What emerges from these kilns is not yet a rock or a metal, but an incredibly fine, light and uniform white powder, pure alumina. And although it may look simple, this material is precisely what opens the door to the final and most spectacular step, the electrolysis that will turn this powder into bright metallic aluminum. With the alumina ready, we reach the crucial moment, smelting through the hall ero process. This is where the white powder finally becomes metallic aluminum. It all starts with carbon anodes, massive blocks made from petroleum, coke and pitch. To give them strength and durability, they are pre-baked in special furnaces until they reach the rigidity needed to withstand extreme temperatures. Each block is about one meter in size, weighs hundreds of kilos and contains steel rods embedded inside, fixed with molten iron to create a solid electrical connection. This assembly is carried out with near robotic precision because any misalignment could compromise the entire process. Next, we enter the electrolytic cells, large tanks lined with carbon that serve as cathodes. Alumina is poured in, dissolved in molten cryolite, a mineral that plays a vital role by lowering the melting point of aluminum oxide from 2000 degrees Celsius to 1000 degrees Celsius thousand to around 900 degrees Celsius, making the process feasible. In this molten bath, a continuous current of thousands of amperes flows between the anodes and cathode. The electricity splits the alumina, releasing liquid aluminum that settles at the bottom of the cell. Meanwhile, 
the oxygen released reacts with the anodes, forming carbon dioxide and gradually consuming these carbon blocks. The cells do not work alone. They are connected in long series called pot lines, which can include hundreds of units operating in parallel. Each cell produces hundreds of kilos of aluminum per day, and to keep efficiency high, fresh alumina is continually added while worn anodes are replaced. This entire process consumes an enormous amount of energy, between 13 and 15 kilowatt hours for every kilo of aluminum. That is why many plants are built near large, low-cost energy sources, especially hydroelectric power. The liquid aluminum that is extracted is not used immediately. It first passes to holding furnaces, where it is kept at around 750 degrees Celsius. There, it is purified by removing impurities such as hydrogen or tiny solid particles through gas injection, fluxes and ceramic filters. These furnaces also allow adjustments to the recipe. Elements like magnesium or silicon can be added to create specific alloys, depending on whether the aluminum will be used for airplanes, cars, cans or electrical cables. The result of this long journey is clean, brilliant molten aluminum. But the story does not end here. It still needs its final shape, whether as ingots, plates or pieces ready for industry. First comes small ingot casting. The liquid aluminum is poured into cast iron moulds, aligned on conveyor chains. Special ladles minimise turbulence during pouring, as even a single air bubble could compromise quality. To cool it without cracking, the process is carefully controlled with jets of water or streams of air. Once solidified, mechanical arms remove the ingots and inspect them, checking weight, shape and surface. Everything happens continuously and automatically, with systems regulating flow and ensuring a smooth, ordered cooling that promotes a stronger and more uniform internal structure. When it comes to giant ingots weighing up to 20 tonnes, the process is even more impressive. Stationary moulds with preheated channels maintain the metal's fluidity, while ceramic filters remove impurities. During pouring, skilled operators manually skim bubbles and dross, polishing the surface almost like a ritual. Once solidified, these massive pieces are moved by overhead cranes to storage or processing areas. The moulds receive non-stick coatings and are monitored with temperature sensors to prevent internal fractures. Before transformation, the ingots go through preheating furnaces, reaching about 500 degrees Celsius. This step softens the metal, relieves stress and prepares it to deform without breaking. Surfaces are cleaned with milling tools or saws, removing oxidized layers and leaving a smooth, bright finish. Next comes hot rolling. Here, ingots, which can weigh 20 tons, are fed into mills with enormous rollers capable of exerting thousands of horsepower. Each pass reduces the block's thickness, which can drop from 50 centimetres to just a few centimetres, turning it into plates or sheets. Edges are trimmed with shears, and thickness is precisely controlled by automatic sensors. If the goal is industrial bars, these plates are cut into strips and sent through additional rolling and drawing processes. Bit by bit, the metal is stretched and refined until it reaches specific diameters. Progressive dies special lubricants and speed-controlled drawing benches are used to achieve a perfect finish. Finally, the bars are straightened, cut to length and inspected one by one to guarantee strength and quality. Thus, what began as a reddish mineral extracted from the earth is transformed into ingots, plates or bars that travel worldwide, ready to become cars, airplanes, structures and, of course, the aluminum foil we use every day. But how is it possible for those heavy aluminum ingots to become thin, flexible sheets we can roll so easily? The answer lies in a carefully controlled process. Once aluminum bars have been melted and purified, with only a few centimetres of thickness, they enter the stage that will turn them into foil. These bars, known as small ingots or slabs, are lightly heated to prepare them before passing through the rolling mills where the solid metal begins its transformation into extremely thin sheets, ready to become the lightweight, versatile material we use every day. The first step is hot rolling, where the slabs pass between large rollers at temperatures exceeding 400 degrees Celsius. This step reduces the metal's thickness, evens out its internal structure, 
and improves its ductility, meaning it can stretch and bend without breaking. After hot rolling, the aluminum is cooled and cut into strips that will then undergo cold rolling, the key stage where aluminum foil achieves its signature fineness. During cold rolling, the aluminum repeatedly passes through precision rollers. To create extremely thin sheets, sometimes less than 0.02 millimeters, the double rolling method is used. Two sheets are placed together and rolled at the same time. This not only prevents the metal from sticking to the rollers, but also directly influences the foil's final finish. This is why aluminum foil has one shiny side and one matte side. Polished steel rollers press against one face of each pair of sheets, leaving it shiny, while the other, in contact with another sheet, becomes slightly dull. This detail is important not just aesthetically, but also functionally. The shiny side reflects heat more effectively, while the matte side absorbs slightly more, a fun fact sometimes applied when baking or storing food. The process does not end there. Each sheet is rolled into giant coils that can be several meters wide and weigh tons. These coils serve as the base for the aluminum foil used in the food, pharmaceutical and household roll industries. To guarantee maximum quality, both visual and automated inspections are carried out. Optical sensors detect wrinkles, air bubbles, or microscopic imperfections that could compromise the foil's strength or uniformity. The history of modern aluminum foil began in the early 20th century. In 1910, the Swiss company Dr. Lauber, Neher and C developed the first thin aluminum sheets as an alternative to tin for wrapping chocolates and sweets. Over time, aluminum proved to be ideal for preserving food. It is resistant to water, air, light and grease. Its ability to keep food fresh and protect delicate products quickly made it an essential material in kitchens and factories. In addition to its strength and flexibility, aluminum foil is valued for its thermal versatility. It can be used in freezers, ovens, and even to wrap light-sensitive items. Its complete recyclability makes it a sustainable material. Aluminum can be melted down and turned back into new sheets without losing any of its properties. Finally, once the aluminum foil has gone through the complex process of rolling, stretching and finishing, it is packaged and prepared for distribution. From there, it reaches supermarkets and stores ready to arrive in our kitchens. And the most surprising part, despite all the work and technology behind its production, this versatile product sells for just a few dollars. It is a perfect example of how something we use every day hides a fascinating and highly refined industrial process. And that's how aluminum is produced and turned into ultra-thin foil. Tell me, what did you think of the process? I'll read your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. In the windows you'll see next, there are more videos that might catch your attention. Feel free to watch one. See you next time.